So hi everyone, my name is Craig. Um, I struggled to find an explanation from a low level view of exactly how a JavaScript type system compiler is implemented. I understood many of the jobs of the type system, but was really unsure on the mechanisms involved and how they work together. So this talk aims to shine a light on the fundamentals at work under the hood. It's not possible to focus on everything in one talk. So here we're gonna be looking at type checks specifically. We're gonna start with an overview of type systems then build our own compiler, which can run type checks and output some sensible messages. So first, a little bit about me. I'm producing an under the hood of series, which this is actually a part of. So far it includes Webpack, React hooks, source maps, VS Code, and there's a couple of others. Uh, they usually include building a small proof of concept to demonstrate the internal mechanisms of the tool. I'm an engineer at FIT, where a startup helping people create fitness habits. I'm a member of the Mocha core team for a little over two and a half years. So I'm a big advocate of testing and open source. Uh, I'm a big football fan of the championship club QPR. And you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at Craig Todd. So this talk is gonna be broken down into two parts. Uh, plan A, part A, is gonna be an overview of type system compilers, including TypeScript. We're gonna look at syntax versus semantics. What is AST, types of compilers, language compilers on their jobs. And then part B will be building our own type system compiler, which looks at the parser, the checker, running our own compiler, and then finally, what have we missed? And that's gonna be having a look at what the things that ours do not do that most other compilers would do. So let's start with an overview. So something which is important to run over early is the difference between syntax and semantics. Syntax is typically code which is native to JavaScript you're essentially asking if the given code is correct for the JavaScript runtime. For example, the below might be syntactically correct, although ignoring the, the type, and then, and then the semantics. So this is code specific to the type system. That is essentially asking if the given types attached to the code are correct. For example, the above could be syntactically correct, but semantically wrong, as we're defining a variable as a number, but setting it as a string. So before we go much further, we need to take a quick look at one of the important mechanisms inside of any JavaScript compiler, that's AST. So AST stands for abstract syntax tree. As I'm sure many of you are aware, it's basically a tree of nodes uh, representing a program of code. A node being the smallest possible unit and is basically a plain old JavaScript object with type and location properties. All nodes have those two properties, but based on the type, they can have various other properties as well. So in AST form, code is very easy to, to manipulate. So operations like adding to code, removing, or even replacing parts becomes much easier. An example is the code at the top, you can, the image, and then just below that is the AST it would produce. And there are websites such as astexplorer.net, uh, which are great at letting you write some JavaScript code and then immediately seeing it's AST. There are really two types of compilers which exist. There are native compilers, which convert code into a form that can be run by a server or a computer, uh, i.e. machine code. A compiler such as the one found in the Java ecosystem converts code into bytecode and then into native machine code. And then there's a language compiler, which is quite a different role. The compilers for TypeScript and Flow and most other JavaScript uh, tools uh, both count in the category as language compilers as they output code into JavaScript. The main difference with native compilers is that they compile for, for tooling sake. So for optimizing code performance or for adding additional features, not to produce the machine code. They all still rely on the JavaScript runtime native compiler to do that. So a few of the core jobs found in any type system compiler are one, performing type checks. By, by this, I mean the introduction of types, often via explicit annotations or implicit inference and a way to check that one type matches another. Uh, then there's trans uh, two, transforming code. Many type systems contain code which is not supported in native JavaScript. For example, type annotations are not supportive, supported, so they must transform from unsupported JavaScript to supported JavaScript. I actually explore transforming code more in my post on web bundlers and my post on source maps. And then three, uh, run from a language server. So for a type system to work in a development environment, it's best if it can run any type checks in an IDE and provide instant feedback for the user. So language servers connect the type system to an IDE. They can run the compiler in the background and rerun when a user saves a file. 
Popular languages, such as TypeScript and Flow, both contain a language server. So for VS Code users, the main extension spawns a language server. Uh, you can actually see my blog post on VS Code for a bit more of an in-depth look at those. So as mentioned at the start, we're just going to be focusing on point one today. So that's performing type checks. So how does a language compiler work? So now we're going to look at a couple of the steps required to perform all the previously mentioned jobs in an efficient and scalable way. There are three common jobs to most compilers in some form of an of another. Step one is where you pass the source code into AST. This involves lexical analysis, which is turning a string of code into a stream of tokens and then syntactic analysis, where we turn our stream of tokens into its AST representation. Parsers uh, are responsible for checking the syntax of the given code. A type system will typically have to house its own parser, often containing thousands of lines of code. There are, there, a lot of them are open source, uh, like Babel and TypeScript, but actually a lot of the, the bigger libraries house their own. So the Babel parser is just over 2000 lines of code to process the code statements which can understand the syntactical analysis of any compiler specific code, uh, but also append the additional information for types. Uh, the Hegel compiler parser attends, appends an additional type annotation property to code, which is a type annotation. And actually, we'll be looking a bit more at that shortly. TypeScript compiler, TypeScript's parser, sorry, is a whopping 8,600 lines of code. It houses an entire superset of JavaScript, which requires the parser to understand all of it. So it, it's far larger than most that you find. Step two is where we transform the nodes on AST, where we manipulate the AST nodes. Here, any transformations to apply to the AST are performed. And then the final step is to generate source code. So here we're gonna turn AST into a string of JavaScript source code. The type system has to map any non-JS compliant AST back to native JS. So how does a type system compiler, compiler fit into this? As well as the mentioned steps, type system compilers will usually include an additional step or two after passing, uh, which, we will, which will include the type specific work. So on a side note, TypeScript actually has a total of five phases in its compiler, and they are the language server preprocessor, which works via import, the parser, the binder, the checker, and the emitter. So as you can see, it's got a preprocessor, which triggers the type compiler to only run over the files which have changed, this will follow any import statements to determine what else could have changed and would need to be included in the next rerun. Additionally, the, the TypeScript compiler actually has the ability to reprocess, to only reprocess the node tree branch of the AST graph, which has changed. That's actually a technique known as lazy compilation. So previously run AST can be stored in memory, which it, it calls look aside tables. And then that allows for even faster compilation in the future. So, for general type system compilers, there are two common jobs. There's inferring. So inferring is required for code which does not have an annotation. Using a predefined algorithm, the engine will calculate what type for a given variable, what, what the type for a given variable or function is. TypeScript uses the algorithm best common type in, and it applies this inside of its binding phase, which is the first of two semantic passes. It considers each candidate type and picks the type that is compatible with all other types. Contextual typing comes into play here, which is using the location in the inference. TypeScript actually introduces the idea of symbols. These are named declarations which connect declaration nodes in the AST to other declarations contributing to the same entity. They are the basic building block of the TypeScript semantic system. And actually when I was digging through it, it was kind of relatively easy to get pretty lost with them. It's a, it's a huge system built with symbols. So, um, I've tried to not follow that same approach so we can kind of really show the mechanisms here today. And then the second common job is checking. So now that inferring is complete and the types have been assigned, the engine can run its type checks. They check the semantics of the given code. And there are many flavors of these types of checks ranging from mismatches to non-existing types. For TypeScript, this is the checker, which is actually the second semantic pass. And it's 20,000 lines of code long. So I really feel that that gives a strong idea of just how complicated and difficult it is to check so many different types across so many different scenarios. The type checker is not dependent on the calling code, i.e. if the file executes any of its own code at runtime, the type checker will process each line in a given file itself and run the appropriate checks. So 
that's it for part A. That's the overview finished. So now we're going to be looking at building our own compiler, which can run type checks for three different scenarios and throw a specific message for each. The reason we're going to limit it to three scenarios is so we can focus on the specific mechanisms that work around each one, and hopefully by the end, have a really strong idea on how to introduce more complex type checks. We will be working with a function declaration and then a function expression, and the expression is going to be calling that declaration. So these are the scenarios. So scenario one is going to be an issue with a type matching a string versus a number. You can see we've defined a function there. We've got a type of number, but we're calling the function with a string. We've got scenario two, where there's an issue with using an unknown type, which is not defined. So again, we're defining our function, but this time with a type which does not exist. And we're calling our function with a string again. And then scenario three, where there's an issue with using a property name not found on the interface. So we've defined an interface, we've defined a function which should be using this interface, and now we're calling that function and actually handing it an object with the wrong property name. So those are our scenarios. Now onto the compiler. There are two parts to the compiler. There's the parser and the checker. And as previously mentioned, we won't be focusing on the parser today. We're just going to be following the Hegel parsing approach of assuming a type annotation object has been attached to all the annotated AST nodes. So what I've basically done is I've hard coded the AST objects. So we're going to go through that now. So scenario one is going to use this parser in AST. So we've got to imagine that it's already been put through the Hegel parser. I've actually put a comment above any of the AST block to clarify what code it's for. So on the left, on line three, you can see the expression AST block for our top line expression statement, which you can see actually on line two commented out. And on the right, on line 21 is the declaration AST. This is for where we have declared our function on line 20, commented out. So staying on the right, on line 46, we return a program AST object, which is the program with both AST nodes in. The program body is basically an array which, which is gonna be holding these objects. So inside the declaration AST, on line 31, you can see the type annotation on the param identifier A, which you can see on line 30, uh, which matches where it sits in the code. So this is what I mean by we've, I've hard coded the, the actual Hegel, the, the, the parser's type annotations. On scenario two, it's going to be using this parser in AST. It's very similar to scenario one with its expression, its declaration, and program AST blocks. The code is seen on line one. However, the difference is on line 12. The type annotation inside the declaration's params array is made up type. And you can see it on line 16, instead of what scenario has, which was a number type annotation. And we can actually see that if we go back and you look on line 30 slide, line, line 35 on the right, you can see the number type annotation. And so if I go back to scenario two, you can see it's now made up type. So the expression and the program AST blocks are, are identical scenario one. So I haven't displayed them here again. So that's really the main, the main change in scenario two between the two AST blocks. And then finally, we've got scenario three, which is gonna use this parser in AST. I apologize, there's a lot of, lot of code on the screen, but um, it's just to get across how the objects look going into the program. So as well as our expression and declaration and program AST blocks, there's now an interface AST block and that, that's on the left. And you can see that starting, the AST starting on line four. And you can see the type, the interface declaration on line five. Also, looking on the far right now, the declaration AST now has a generic type on its annotation, and you can see that on line 74. So instead of it being a, a string or, or a numeric, it's now a generic type. And that's actually just something I've called uh, it because it's an object. And this is, the, this is the part that takes our object identifier, which is person, and you can see its name on line 77. Uh, yeah, and the, init the initial code for this is on the top on line 60. So similarly to scenario one and two, the program AST is going to return an array of these three objects for this scenario. So you can see on line 50, if I go back to scenario one, the program AST body in this, in scenario three, it's going to be an array of all three AST blocks. Whereas for scenario one and two, it's just got the expression and declaration. Uh, so as you can see from this the previous slides, the main area which actually holds the type annotation object for all three scenarios is the declaration parameter, which is the declaration AST. 
all three have that in common. So you can see line 71 here, got type annotation, line 12 here, type annotation on scenario two, and on scenario one on line 34. So, and they're all, so all of the type annotations are under the declaration AST. So now onto the part of the compiler which does our type checks. We've got three slides to look at for this, all under the single function, which is called checker. So what does it need to do? It needs to iterate through all the program body AST objects, and depending on the node type, do the appropriate checks. We're, we're gonna add any errors onto an array to be returned to the caller for printing, so we can actually see the error. So before we go any further, the basic logic we will work with for each type is, is this. So for our function declaration, we're gonna check the types for the argument are valid, then check each statement in the block body. For our expression, we're gonna find the function declaration for the caller. We're gonna grab the type of the declaration's argument, lastly grab the type of the expression's call argument, and then compare them to make sure that they're the same type. So this code contains the type, uti type checks utility object and uh, an empty errors array, which will be used to check our expression and a basic annotation check. So nothing has been called yet, we're just defining this utility object. So this object has got, this is for, for the expression, there are two types of checks. So on line 13, you can see the numeric type annotation. Here the caller type should be a numeric literal, as you can see on line 14. So if, if it was annotated as a number, the caller type should be a number. Scenario one would fail here, but nothing has actually been logged yet. For our, there's also a generic type annotation on line 15. And if it's an object, we search the tree for an interface declaration, the, the, the uh, scope. Uh, we see, you can see on line 19, and then we check each property of the caller on that interface, which you can see on line 26 to 35. We're checking each property on the caller. And then if there are any issues, they're gonna get pushed into the errors array. And you can see that on line 30 with a helpful message about what property name does exist and therefore what it could actually be. This is actually limited because uh, it only works with, with the one object, but it's a proof of concept. Scenario three would fail here and get this error. So you can probably see that the processing is gonna be limited to this file, to, to, to the file it's given. However, most type checks will have a notion of scope. So they're able to determine if a declaration was anywhere in the runtime and not just available in this program. Again, ours has an easier job because it's this proof of concept. So uh, slide number two, this code contains the processing of each node type in the program body. So this is where the type check logic that we defined previously is gonna be called from. So let's walk through the code again and then break it down by type. So here we have the function declaration, which is where we would define our function. Uh, you can see that on line 48. So we start by processing the arguments and the params on line 49. If it finds a type annotation, which here it does on line 51, well, on line 51, check if the type exists for the argument given, i.e. the arg type. If it does not, add an error to the errors, which was on line 56. Scenario two, we get an error here because the type does not exist. Lastly, we process the function body. However, as we know there's no function body to process, I've left it blank. The function body is the actual block of the function. And if you remember, when I defined the function, there was nothing actually inside of it. It was all about the arguments and, and the type definition. So now onto the last slide of code. This is the final bit. Here we have the expression statement at line 69 on the left top. First, we check the program body for the declaration of the function on line 71. So we've got to go off and find the declaration. This is where scope would apply to real chart checker. So if no declaration is found, add an error to the, to the errors array, which we're doing on line 79. Next on the right, we check each defined argument type against the caller argument type. And then if there's a type mismatch found, then add an error onto the errors array, which we're doing on line 105. So both scenario one and scenario two will get this error. So what a mouthful. Now we can have a look at what this is output, outputted. So I've introduced a basic repository with a simple index file and some tests, which processes these AST nodes and logs the errors. When I run it, I get this output. So here you can see the errors for scenario one is type Craig string is incompatible with number. And I've actually just realized that that should probably be the string literal because it's the type that it should give us, but 
proof of concept. Uh, then scenario errors for scenario two, we can see we've got the type Craig string, oh, I've done it again, <laughs> is incompatible with undefined. So this would again be a string literal. And then we've also got type made up for argument A does not exist. This is where the type match type does not exist. And then errors for scenario three, uh, this is the interface. Property nam does not exist on interface person. Did you mean name? So if we are to summarize what these are actually talking about, scenario one, we defined an argument type of number, but we called it with a string. Scenario two, we defined a type on the function argument, which does not exist, and then we called our function. So we get two errors, one for the bad type defined, one for the type mismatch. And then scenario three, we defined an interface, but used the property called nam, which was not on the object. We asked if, it asked if, if we meant to use name instead. So that's it. It's a basic type checker in less than 100 lines of code. So what have we missed? As mentioned, there are many, many, many additional parts to a type compiler, which we've omitted from our compiler. And some of these are listed here. So we can start with the most basic, which is the parser. You know, we, we manually wrote these as T blocks. Uh, within a real compiler, these would have to be generated. Then there's the pre-processing in the language server. A real compiler has this uh, language, language server mechanism to plug into an IDE and rerun at appropriate times. Ours doesn't. There's the lazy compilation. We've got no intelligence around what's being changed or, or, use, or storing any of the AST blocks in memory. Uh, the transform step, we've completely skipped the final part of the compiler, which is where it would be converted back into our JavaScript code, which can actually be read by the JavaScript runtime. And also scope, which is something we meant, touched on a few times. As it's a proof of concept, it's all in a single file, didn't really need to know the notion of scope. However, rural compilers have to be really aware of what has access to what. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I learned a huge amount from this research on type on type systems. Um, I hope it was useful for you. You can find the repository for the code and the tests on, on, GitHub, on GitHub at this link. And also you can check my site for more under the hoods, which is craigtob.dev. So thank you very much for listening.